refreshing break. So, we've got Professor Gary Francioni. I'm afraid we can't get his wife and a child from, uh, on Skype. But Gary Francioni is Board of Governors Distinguished Professor of Law at Rutgers University and Honorary Professor of Philosophy at the University of East Anglia, UK. He was the first academic to teach animal rights theory in an American law school. With his colleague and partner, Anna Charlton, who is adjunct professor at Rutgers, he started and directed the first animal rights law clinic anywhere at Rutgers University from 1990 to 2000. He has developed the abolitionist uh, approach to animal rights, which is centered around six principles, including that veganism is a moral imperative. Professor Francione is the author of numerous books and articles on animal ethics and animal law, including The Animal Rights Debate, Abolition or Regulation, 2010, Animals as Persons, Essays on the Abolition of Animal Exploitation, 2008, Introduction to Animal Rights, Your Child or the Dog, 2000, Reign Without Thunder, The Ideology of the Animal Rights Movement, 1996, and Animals, Property and the Law, 1995. Professors Francioni and Charlton have co-authored three books directed to the advocacy community and focused on creative, non-violent, vegan advocacy. Advocate for Animals, an abolition, abolitionist vegan handbook, 2017. Animal Rights, the abolitionist approach, 2015. And Eat Like You Care, an examination of the morality of eating animals, 2013. They have two websites, howdoigovegan.com and abolitionistapproach.com. Is it all right if I close this? Can I close this? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Well, thank you, Suze, and thank you, Mahesh, and everyone else who's participated and made this happen. Um, it's wonderful to be with, uh, with you all and with some of my fine friends, Bill and Marlene and Michael Clapper, who I met 35 years ago this month at an event in Washington, D.C., and we had both been at, at it for a few years then. So I'm having a sort of midlife crisis right now. But no, but seriously, I mean, I, I was going to talk about veganism. I was going to talk about veganism and vivisection. And I'm not going to do that because um, I'm not going to, I mean, Alpish has basically covered the whole vivisection topic, and, and, and he's done it well. And, you know, my view is basically we're using more animals in experiments now than we were using when I first got involved in this in the, the early 1980s, the, early, the late 1970s, actually. And, and, um, and I don't think, you know, as long as people are willing to exploit animals, as long as they're willing to eat animals when they don't have to, um, uh, you, you know, we're, we're going to continue to use animals in experiments because if you don't care about animals, if you, don't, if, if you don't think they matter morally and you're willing to eat them when you have no good reason other than you like the taste of them, if you're willing to wear them because you like the way you look in them or whatever, then you're not going to have a problem with people killing some to cure the, or supposedly to cure the diseases um, or in an effort, however futile, but in an effort to try to find a solution for the problems that you've caused by eating them. So, I mean, as long as we really do need, veganism is the baseline and we've got to, we've got to really get there. But, so I've decided what I want to do is I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about the, the, the approach, the, the abolitionist approach to animal rights that I have developed over the past three decades with my partner and comrade, Anna Charlton. She couldn't be here today. She, she just texted me to say that she's watching a live stream, so I love you, I'll see you tomorrow. Um, and, and, um, and I wanna talk about those, I wanna talk about, because you know, we need a paradigm shift. We are killing billions of animals, 80 billion land animals, and, and nobody even knows how many sea animals we're killing every year. The lowest estimate I've seen is a trillion. The level of violence is mind-boggling. It's absolutely mind-boggling. 
So I think we have a moral crisis. We have a level of violence that we live with every single day that many of us participate in. We need to, you know, and, and you know, I've been, doing, I've been doing this for a long time. And I don't see it getting any better. I'm still hearing people talking about making it more humane and focusing on this campaign or that campaign. We need a shift. We need a complete rethinking of the issue. And we need to do it soon. It's not only a matter of violence. It's a matter of baby boomer generation, of which I am a member. We're getting old. We are going to destroy the health care system. We are going to destroy. We're going to bankrupt the health care system. There will be nothing left. By the time we're all dead, there will be nothing left for the rest of you. And the reality is, global warming is an imminent problem. We've got 12, 15 years left. We're not going to have a technological innovation. We can't, there's not enough time to develop, test, and, and, and implement a technological innovation. It ain't going to happen. Okay? We're not going to have a technological innovation that's going to save us. And if you're looking at governments, I find it odd. I find it actually disconcerting that you have this extinction rebellion. People saying, we've got to get the government to do X, Y, and Z. I got news for you. Governments do nothing except make matters worse. Governments exist to serve corporations and moneyed interests. If you are expecting the government of the United Kingdom, the United States, my God, look at who, <laughs> look at who our president is. I mean, I mean, if you expect governments to solve the problem, you are tripping out in a way that I've never experienced. So, so I mean, it, 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 you, you just, I can't understand why, it's disconcerting to me that people say, ah, oh, well, you know, we're gonna get the government. You see, the government, the government. The government, you're gonna get the government. You're gonna get the United Kingdom government, the same government that completely disregards massive protests in the street and continues to get involved in stupid wars with the United States, and does, do, does all sorts of, you're gonna get the government to change, ain't gonna happen. If we don't have a massive transition to veganism very soon, if we don't have a massive transition, we will not avert climate catastrophe. So we really do need to start thinking outside the box and start approaching this matter in a different way. I want to talk to you briefly about the six principles of the abolitionist approach. If we have time, I'm more than happy to answer questions. Principle number one, every sentient being. Sentient being is a being that is, that is subjectively aware, a being that, has, that is able to experience pain. That's all, it's the only characteristic that's necessary. Every sentient being has the right not to be property. He has one right, the right not to be property. Now, we can disagree about what rights people have. And there, you know, obviously there will be disagreement. Some people will think that people ought to have, you know, some, some rights, some people will disagree with that, okay? But we all agree that chattel slavery is wrong. Why do we think chattel slavery is wrong? We think it's wrong because if someone is a chattel slave, then that human is not a person but a thing because all of that beings, all of that, that, that human's interests can be evaluated and valued by somebody else and valued at zero, the owner of that person, okay? So even we can disagree about other forms, you know, about whether conduct constitutes discrimination, and we can talk about whether, whether or not certain things are objectionable or not, but nobody defends human chattel slavery. That is not to say it doesn't exist. It does exist, and it's a serious problem. Nobody defends it because it's not defensible, because it denies the fundamental personhood. It denies the fundamental personhood of humans who are chattel because they are not persons anymore. They are things. They are commodities. Okay? The same thing with animals. Animals are property. They are commodities. They are chattel. They are things. We buy them. We sell them. You know, people said, people always say to me, yeah, but I've got a dog or a cat or, you know, and they're members of my family. Well, great. 
You know what that means? It means you got property and you value it. Because that's one of the incidents of property ownership is you get the right to determine what value your property has. Okay? And, and so we live with five non-human refugees. We take in dogs that, that have health problems. We have a blind and a deaf dog. Um, we take dogs that other people don't want. I love them. I love them very much. But you know what? One of the, re the, the main reason why Anna's not here is because we can't just have somebody, just anybody, come in and stay with them because they have certain requirements and whatnot, and the person who normally stays with them was unable to come. So I could say, even though I love them, but they are my property, which means that if I say, you know, it's inconvenient to have these dogs because you can't come with me to this event. So let's just take them and put them in the car and take them to the veterinarian and have them killed because I've got the right to do that. They are my property. So just like you've got a right to, you know, if you really like your car and you value your car high, that's fine. You can do that. Or you can just like never take care of your car or do very much except to get it through the inspection. You know, you do the minimal amount. But it's your car. If you want to like fetishize it, you can do that. If you want to just sort of do an occasional oil change and get it inspected and whatnot to get it through the, to get it through the, the, the uh, regulatory thing, the regulatory uh, inspection, you can do that too. Same thing with your animals. I mean, we own them. They are property. Every animal out there, including the wild animals. The animals, the animals in the wild are basically owned by the state. Okay? They basically are owned by the state, and the state then, during hunting seasons and things like that, gives permission to people to go in uh, and take, kill, and reduce to their possession certain of those animals. But all an animals are property. They are things. They are chattel. They are commodities. They only have economic value. They don't have intrinsic or inherent value. They only have extrinsic or economic value. Okay? They are things. And so somebody else, their owner, has the right to value them at zero, their fundamental interest, their interest in that. There are certain limits, but they're not many. There are laws, there are all sorts of laws that supposedly protect them. You want to know how much protection they really get? Close your eyes. What do you see? That's what they get. Okay? The laws do basically nothing. I'm going to get into that in a few minutes. Laws are useless when it comes to animal regulation, regulation of animal welfare. Um, Okay, so basically, the first principle is animals have the right not to be treated as property, just like all humans have the right not to be treated as property. And we don't, we don't link that with, we don't say, well, you know, you have that right only if you're a certain intelligence level or only if you have a pleasant appearance or only if you're physically, we, we basically say, look, as long as you're alive, as long as you're functioning, we don't think you should be chattel property, okay? Because we think that that is morally indefensible. It is also the case it's morally indefensible where animals are concerned, okay? So all animals, all sentient beings have the right, one fundamental moral right, not to be treated as property. But if you recognize that right, it means you cannot justify the institutionalized exploitation of animals. Because the only reason why we are able to eat them, wear them, use them in all sorts of ways is because they're property. And once you say we can't justify treating them as property, once you say they have moral value, we have to treat them as non-human persons. A person doesn't mean human. A person just means a, someone who matters, someone who matters morally, someone that has value, OK? Person and human are not, this, they're not synonymous terms. So once you say animals have moral value and that they are non-human persons, it means you can't justify institutionalized exploitation anymore. That recognition, uh, recognition of that one right, the right not to be property, means it all goes. None of it can be defended because it all rests on the status of animals as property, as things, as human resources. Once you say that's not right, then all, the whole basis of institutionalized exploitation melts away. That's principle one, number one. Principle number two, don't support 
welfare measures, abolitionist, the abolitionist approach is inconsistent with supporting welfare measures, making exploitation more humane. If exploitation is wrong, then we should not be promoting humane exploitation. Now you could say, well, wait a minute now, isn't it better that, you know, that, we're, that we're being more humane than less humane? And the answer is, well, sure, it's better. It's better, you know, it, it's better to, if, if, if I'm gonna kill you, it's better if I just shoot you rather than torture you. But just shooting you doesn't all of a sudden become okay. Okay, is it better? Yeah, it may be better. M more suffering is worse than less suffering. Less suffering is better than more suffering, but it doesn't answer the fundamental moral question. So if we think that animals have a right not to be treated as property, we cannot justify the idea of humane exploitation. Okay, and also remember something. When we promote cage, you know, uh, campaigns for bigger cages or for various other welfare measures, what we're doing is we're sending out a normative message that there is a morally acceptable way to do the wrong thing. We're sending out a message. When you, tell pe when you say to people, oh, well, cage-free eggs are better than conventional battery eggs, or crate-free pork is, you know, it, it, we, we, we promote these, these welfare measures. What we're doing is we're saying to people that, there's something, that it's morally acceptable and maybe even desirable to eat these more humanely or consume these more humanely raised products. So it's not just a question of measures that reduce suffering. It's a matter of a moral, a normative message that is, that is, is, is transmitted to people. And that basically says, yeah, doing these things, you know, if you eat, I mean, I, I encounter people all the time who say, oh, yeah, I'm with you about the animal rights thing. I only eat, you know, I only eat eggs that, you know, that, that are, I only eat free range eggs. And, you know, then I have to stop and discuss with the person, explain to the person that a free range egg, depending on what free range means, um, and what, what conditions the animal's been raised in, may be a little tiny bit better, but, there's still an enormous amount of suffering and an enormous amount of death that goes into the most humanely raised egg that you can get in a store. Okay? So the most humanely produced animal products are things that involve an enormous amount of suffering and death. So we shouldn't be promoting this idea that, uh, that, that, that more humane forms of exploitation are better or acceptable, okay? Because that sends out the wrong message. Also, because animals are property, <coughs> excuse me, welfare, the, the, the standards of animal welfare will always be low. They're economic commodities. It costs money to protect their interests, and we generally protect their interests only when we get an economic benefit. So we have rules that, for example, say unless it's a religious uh, slaughter, you have to stun an animal. You have to stun the animal before the animal's cut, shackled, and hoisted. Why do we do that? We do that because you had a cow with a chain around her back leg that is pulled up, and she's fully conscious. What what happens is her pelvis breaks, and then she starts moving around a lot. And what does that do? It hits people and causes injuries to the workers, and it causes carcass damage. Animal welfare, if you look at the history of animal welfare, that was the first book I wrote in the 1990s, was about looking at the history of animal welfare reform in Britain and the United States. And what I concluded was that animal welfare measures, for the most part, did little more than make animal exploitation more economically efficient. The standards are always going to be low. They have to be low. They have to be low because the more protection we give the animals, the more expensive that product becomes. And there are market forces, and all sorts of complex market forces, because markets are no longer just national markets. They are regional markets, as you know with the Brexit situation. They are international markets. They're also, I mean, the markets have changed dramatically. And they exert a tremendous pressure on the price of animal products. So animal welfare reform is always going to be basically, it was basically going to do very, very little. As a matter of fact, animal welfare reform does little more than make animal exploitation economically efficient. That's basically what it does. It's useless. 
Also, I think we need to sort of question whether or not single issue campaigns. You know, I remember when I first got involved in this in, the, in you know, eight million years ago, the big issue was fur, the anti-fur campaign. Well, what the hell's the difference between fur and leather? I mean, leather is like, you know, you got the skin. If the skin's got the hair on it, we call it fur. If the skin doesn't have the hair on it, we call it leather. What's the difference between fur and wool? There isn't. Okay? You can say, well, but they're not killing your sheep. What do you think? Do you think that they die of old age? Uh, no, they don't die of old age. They are eventually slaughtered. Okay? And also, if you've ever seen sheep being shorn, they freak out. They're, they're, they don't like to be touched. They, they get, they're, very, they're, very, um, they're prey animals, and they like to basically be left alone. When they're being shorn, they're terrified. They get cut. There is a process, they don't use it in Britain, I don't think, called mulesing, where they remove the skin from around the anus because flies will come and lay eggs around the, the anus and, and they, don't want, they, don't, they don't want that to happen. I mean, I've seen this in, not the UK, but I've seen it in the United States. Um, and, and as I understand it, it's fairly common in places like Australia. They just rip the skin off of the anus and then they let it scar up. And it's very, very painful. And you can see that it's very painful when they do this to the, to, to the sheep. So the bottom line is, is that there's no real difference. So, the, so we have these stupid campaigns. And these things only exist for one purpose, to generate donations for the 27 trillion animal organizations out there that are all competing for the same money. So they have these campaigns where you know, they get a bunch of people who are wearing leather and wool to sort of say, ah, oh, bad, you're wearing fur. You know? And that there's, you know, you, I feel morally superior because I'm wearing wool and leather, and you are evil because you are wearing fur. And I, I quickly understood in the 1980s, um, when I saw the anti-fur demonstrations, how sexist they were, basically. That the whole anti-fur campaign was one big excuse for people to call women names. And that's what they did. I remember when I was a young lawyer, I, I used to represent people who were having these, these, these demonstrations. And I remember being in Manhattan, um, I used, I'm a New Yorker, and, um, and I remember being at a demonstration where we were outside the Chinese embassy. I don't remember why, what was going on with the Chinese embassy, but this was probably 1980, God, maybe 82, I don't know, it was a long time ago. And so, um, and every woman walking by, people were like calling them horrible names, I mean really sexist, vile names. People wearing leather and people wearing wool we're calling women who wear fur coats horrible names. And I had to sort of you know, take the organizer aside and say, um, I'm providing free legal services. If you wish me to continue to do so, um, you need to shut these people up and stop that sort of abusive uh, language because it's sexist and it's wrong. And, um, but you know, it's the same thing. It's like foie gras, or, or do, the, uh, what I, the one I love is people get all excited about the eating of dogs in Asia. You know, and so, so you see on, you know, on the internet, you see all this anti-Asian rhetoric about, oh, you know, the people in China, the people in Korea, evil people because they're eating dogs. Said by whom? People who are stuffing their mouths with chicken while they're busy upset with the people in China. I mean, I don't think the people in China or Korea should be eating dogs. I don't think we should be eating chickens. So, you know, it, these campaigns make no sense whatsoever. None whatsoever. And what they do is they encourage people to feel morally superior. And, and, you know, and when you feel morally superior and someone's sort of giving you a framework to exercise your moral superiority, what you do is you give them a donation. Oh yes, we must stop those evil Asian people. So let me give you a donation so that we can do something about this. But there's no difference between eating a dog and eating a chicken. Sorry. You know, I mean, we just fetishize dogs. They don't. We don't fetishize chickens. But that's just a matter of what and who we fetishize. It has nothing to do with morality. Um, the third principle, veganism is a moral baseline. I, I totally respect, um, I mean, I mean the, the work that Marlene and Bill do and the work that Clapper, I mean, Michael was, was the original. I mean, he was doing it when nobody else was in terms of being a doc, you know, being a physician who was busy telling people not to eat animals because it was bad for their health. And um, so he was, he was I believe he was the first person, certainly was the first person I was aware of, and it was years before anybody else really showed up. And, um, but I, and I totally respect the work that they do 
um, in terms of promoting the idea that eating animal products is really bad for your health, because it is. But as far as I'm concerned, it's a matter of, it, it is a matter of health. Don't mean to denigrate that in any way, but it's fundamentally a matter of justice. It's wrong. If they are, if they have moral value, if they're not things, you either think that they have moral value or you think that they're things functionally indistinguishable from all the other things that we have in our lives. If you think they have moral value, we cannot eat them, wear them, use them. We just can't. It's a, this is a matter of logic, people. This is a matter of simple logic. If they have moral value, they can't be resources. Something cannot be, have moral value and simultaneously be a resource. Something cannot simultaneously be a thing and have moral value. Okay? If we think they have moral value, we cannot treat, continue to treat them as things, which means we got to get them off of our plates, off of our backs, off of our feet, end of story. We cannot justify continuing to treat them as resources. It is a simple matter of justice. It's what we owe them. It's what we owe them. And you know, what's interesting is you can say, well, you know, it's a bit, bit extreme, isn't it? Well, actually, no, I think, I think what's extreme is the fact that we are a society that says we love animals while we, while we participate directly in the exploitation of billions of land animals and trillions of sea animals. It is, that's what's extreme. The, the, the moral hypocrisy of that is what's extreme. I mean, think about it for a second. Almost everybody you will meet believes that it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals. Virtually everybody. What does that mean? Well, we could have an interesting discussion about what necessity means. We don't have to. If the, if the principle against unnecessary suffering has any content whatsoever, it means that we cannot justify the, imp the imposition of suffering or death for reasons of pleasure, amusement, or convenience. Because think about it, if you have a rule that says, well, you know, I think it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on children, but, you know, occasionally I like to hear them scream, so I torture them, you know, because I, I enjoy that, you would say, well, you know, first of all, you're weird, and secondly, <laughs> secondly, that's an exception which now swallows up the rule. Okay, that's an exception which swall swallows up the rule. So we all agree that it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals. And we all agree that it's wrong to inflict suffering on animals for reasons of pleasure, amusement, or convenience. Okay, fine. Why aren't we all vegans then? Because what's the best justification we have for killing those zillions of animals? And the answer is they taste good. That's the best justification we have. We don't need to eat animals to be optimally healthy. I mean, what you've been hearing today is is the empirical evidence, which is overwhelming in my judgment, that we don't need to, be, to eat animals to be optimally healthy. But you don't even have to accept that. All you've got to accept, and this is a complete no-brainer, is that you're not gonna be less healthy if you don't eat animals. And there is nobody sane would tell you that you're gonna be less healthy if you eat a vegan, a, a good, sensible, I'm not talking about eating iceberg lettuce, I'm talking about eating a sensible vegan diet. Nobody could tell you you're going to be less healthy. Okay? So, you know, I, I, was, I was having a, I was, um, a couple years ago, a kid in Brooklyn, which is uh, part of New York City, and um, a kid kicked a cat. And, you know, because everything that we do is now on phones, some, some other kids filmed this guy kicking the cat. He didn't kill the cat, he just kicked the cat. And somebody, so, somehow the, the, the video got to the prosecutor and they prosecuted this kid for animal cruelty. And, and um, people were outraged about this. They were absolutely outraged about this. And so I was asked by CNN, which is, uh, you, have, you, have C, you have CNN here, right? Okay. And, and so I was asked by CNN to come on to talk about this. And I think they assumed that because I was an animal rights person, I was going to be in favor of putting this kid in jail. So I was asked, you know, should this kid go to jail? And I said, well, you know, I'm a little troubled by this case because, um, first of all, the kid was a, was a, he was a, a, a young black guy. And I thought a lot of the rhetoric about him was totally racist. 
But I said, you know, I said, it seems to me, I said, what this, I'm not defending what this guy did. What he did was wrong. I said, but he didn't kill the cat. What he did was wrong. He shouldn't have done it. And I said, and what's sort of weird is that at 6 o'clock at night, millions of people are watching this. And they're shoveling their chicken and their fish and their steak and their milk and their eggs into their mouth while they say, yeah, send that kid to jail. And I said, you know, if you're going to put the kid in jail, then you're going to have to build bigger prisons, which in America is a big, I mean, we put everybody in jail. And, you know, like four-fifths four of the population is in jail. And, um, um, and, and, um, and so, you know, you're going to have to build really big jails to shove, shove all those people in because how are we any different? Well, you know, but we're not kidding. Yeah, right. We, we go to the store and we buy it. As I tell myself, I teach criminal law. It's one of the subjects I teach. It don't matter whether I shoot you or whether I pay somebody else to shoot you. It's still murder. <laughs> and so it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, people get all upset about people who hunt. You know, non-vegans get upset about people who hunt. Think about that for a second. You know, think about that. What's the difference between hunting an animal and going to the store and buying the corpse in a package? You're responsible for the suffering and the death in both cases. So, I mean, how is that morally any different? It's not. So we all think it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals, but yet we participate in that. That's what's extreme. Veganism's not extreme, folks. What's extreme is we all claim to care about animals while we act in ways which are completely inconsistent with our caring about animals. So I would suggest to you, veganism is great. Look, I've been a vegan for almost 40 years. I was talking to Michael today. I can't remember the last time I had a cold, and I teach in a university. I have people sneeze. I have kids sneezing on me and coughing on me all the time. Students are perpetually ill, and 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 I cannot remember the last time I had a cold. I mean, the idea. I, I didn't do it. I did not do it for health reasons. As a matter of fact, when I became a vegan, I had doctors telling me, "Oh, you're going to get sick. You're not going to get enough protein. You're going to your eyes are going to fall out of your." I mean, I mean, you know, all all this sort of stuff. Back then, I became I became a vegan in the early '80s. And, and so it's, you know, it's, it's been a while. And, um, and you know, I, I, I actually did think it was probably bad for my health, but I knew one thing. It was good for the health of my spirit. You know, and I just didn't want to participate in violence anymore. If you've ever, have you, how many people in this room have ever been to a slaughterhouse? I really recommend you do it sometime. I've been to about 30 in my life and I've been to egg batteries, and I've been to dairy farms, and I have seen it all. And let me tell you, there ain't no morally coherent distinction between meat and dairy products. None, nada, okay? <coughs> dairy involves, there's as much suffering and death in a, glass, in a glass of milk as there is in a pound of steak. As a matter of fact, dairy is actually horrible. The cows are constantly kept impregnated, and then their babies are taken away from them, and that is actually one of the most horrifying things in the world. If you've ever seen it, when they actually remove the babies from the, the, the mother's child. It's, it's so sad and so unnecessary. Why do we participate in that? If we claim to not want violence, if we claim to value nonviolence, why do we participate in that? It's not, there's no need for it. You don't need, as a matter of fact, we're the only species that drinks the milk. First of all, only babies drink milk of any species. We are the only species that drinks milk when we're adults, and we drink the milk of another species. I mean, you know, and I just love people say, well, don't you think veganism is extreme? You know, <laughs> while they're drinking a glass of milk. I mean, how, how peculiar is that? Okay, I mean, how peculiar is that? So, you know, we're eating decomposing flesh, cow mucus and chicken ova, and, and then people say, well, you know, you're eating those plants and those, that's extreme. Um, and it's not really when you think about it, okay? And so you don't need to eat animal products to be optimally healthy. Indeed, as you've heard from some of the speakers today, you'll probably be much healthier if you don't eat those products. And you're certainly not gonna be less healthier. You're certainly not gonna be less healthier um, and, or less healthy. And so, so 
that and that's really the only question that's relevant for the moral for the, the moral issue. And as I said, it's contributing to global. I mean, animal agriculture. If you if you are a vegan, you have a larger carbon footprint than if you were driving a couple of Hummers and taking 300 showers a day. I mean, the numbers are just remarkable. And, and you know, and well, anyway, so it's, it's not necessary, okay? We all recognize and we all criticize other people when they engage in gratuitous violence with animals or, you know, in gratuitous violence generally, but we all, we have no problem being upset with people who engage in fox hunting or badger culling or bullfighting or all bad things. I'm not defending them. But you know what? Some people like to sit and watch bulls get gored. I mean, I, ain't my idea of a good time. But I mean, some people like to do that. Some people who, who are upset about the fact that bulls are treated in that way have no problem eating a steak or drinking a milkshake, it's all the same thing, all of it. None of it is necessary, all of it is gratuitous. And we end up pointing fingers at people who are engaging in gratuitous harm while we engage in gratuitous harm. Point number four, sentience is the only thing that matters. We fetishize, we say, well, animals that are closest to, are closer to us, matter more, if they have more human intelligence, you know, so elephants, you know, because elephants mourn their dead or because, you know, the, you know, because whales are monogamous or whatever, you know, the, the closer that they are to human behavior, the, you know, the closer they are to us, okay, the more they matter. That's nonsense. That's speciesist, okay? I would suggest that the only thing that matters is sentience. And this idea that they've got to have certain levels of intelligence. I mean, look, intelligence may matter for certain purposes. If we say we've got somebody who's mentally disabled and somebody who's really smart, and the university's got to hire a, a, a lecturer for surgery or some, some topic. Well, obviously, you should hire the person who has the academic ability. However, if the question is, who do we use as a non-consenting subject in a biomedical experiment? Who do we use as a forced organ donor? The intelligent person or the person who's mentally disabled? And the answer is, you don't use either of them. You don't treat either of them as a resource. We've got to get away from this idea that, that, character, that, that, that cognitive characteristics make you more morally valuable. They may entitle you to make more money because that's the sort of society we have, and we could talk about whether that's a good idea, but, but they entitled you to get more existential opportunities, but not having those cognitive abilities cannot, does not justify treating you as a resource. We see that where, I, I hope most of us see that where humans are involved, we should see it where non-humans are involved as well. I mean, it all comes from this idea, which came in the, in the, in the 19th century when we started thinking about animals morally. We, we, we had, I mean, if you go back to Jeremy Bentham, who was a lawyer and philosopher, who was in many ways is, pro is probably the primary person who put animals on the moral map. He said, well, you know, animal suffering, it doesn't matter whether they can think or reason or whatever. What matters is they can feel pain. They've got minds that can experience pain, and that's all that matters for them to have morally significant interest in not suffering. However, he said we can continue to use animals because they're not self-aware. They can't look at themselves in the mirror and say, oh, that's me. And you know, are, are animals self-aware? The answer, of course they're self-aware. They're not self-aware the same way a normal human is self-aware. But that doesn't mean they're not self-aware. Okay, they're just aware of themselves. They don't, they don't have the same autobiographical sense of self. But why should that matter? So what? If you've got somebody who's got transient global amnesia, they're unable to think about the past and they're unable to, to, to project themselves into the future. They're sort of stuck in an eternal present, which is the way I think many people think of animals. They, they live in an eternal present. I don't personally think that's true, but as far as I'm concerned, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant whether they're stuck in an eternal present because you know what? They're aware of themselves in that present and they have an interest and want to get to the next second of consciousness. So this idea that, well, they've got to have a certain sort of cognitive capacity in order to matter morally is nonsense. The fifth principle is a relationship of 
animal exploitation and other forms of exploitation. Uh, this is something um, people get upset with me a lot because they say, well, you know, this is not the movement. Animal movement is not a political movement. Well, I don't, know, I don't know what you mean by political, but as far as I'm concerned, it is an idea of and a movement of the left. The problem is we otherize non-human animals. They are the other. We draw the line. And the line is basically, for most of human history, has been white men on one side, everybody else on the other. That's the way it's worked. In many ways, it's the way it still works, unfortunately. Uh, we've made some inroads, but not nearly enough. And, and so we otherize. We otherize non-humans. Just like we otherize people of color and women and gay people and everybody else. We otherize. That is the basic problem. It's all the same thing. You know, I remember in 1984 when I taught this the first time, I compared um, our consumption of animals to pornography. That basically we went to the store and we bought an animal in a package. There was no more animal there. It was something in a, in a, in a pet. We were consuming a body part. We didn't even know whose body it was and we didn't think about the somebody whose body it was. Just like when we consume pornography. There's no person there anymore. We consume body parts. And I remember people thinking, you know, this was like years before the sexual politics of meat was written. This was probably, you know, five, six years before that was written. And I still believe that. I still think it's all the same sort of thing. It's all related. Racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, it's all the same. It's, it, it's, it's an insidious quality that we humans have of otherizing. That is the basic problem. That's the root of the problem. The sixth principle is nonviolence. The history of humankind has been the history of violence. If violence worked to do anything, we would be living in the Garden of Eden right now because we've had violence forever. Violence always undertaken in the name of a greater good. Nobody ever engages in violence for the sake of violence. What they do is they say, well, you know, I don't like violence. You know, you hear this all the time from these politicians. Well, you know, I don't like war, but we need to have a war to get to peace. That's nonsense. That way of thinking is, is destroying us. And so my view is that we're not going to win this. We're not going to change the paradigm by yelling at people and telling people that they're bad people because, you know, the bottom line is you need to educate people in creative, nonviolent ways about all of this. It's never going to, ha it's never going to come about by engaging in yet another form of otherization of I'm better than you are. I don't think, I don't mean, you know, and, and, and I, I think it's really important. I think what I, I, one of the things that really troubles me about a lot of animal advocacy is you get people who are sort of constantly projecting to other people that they think that they're morally inferior. And the answer is, look, we're not able to see into anybody else's heart. I mean, I can tell you, I don't think we can justify animal exploitation, but I'm not going to make any moral judgments about you or anybody else because I don't know what goes on in your heart. I'm telling you, I don't think you can justify that behavior, and I think you need to reassess it. But the only way we're ever going to get anywhere, I don't know how many of you are vegans. I'm sure you're all very nice people in many ways. If you are not vegans, then if you care about animals, if you think animals matter morally, then I would suggest to you, you need to rethink issues um, seriously. You know? But I think we need, to be, we need to educate people in creative, nonviolent ways about what is, I think, the issue. I mean, I don't want when people say, well, do you think this, this you know, I, I mean, I always find it odd when people say to me, ask me a question, um, do you think what we do to animals is worse than what Hitler did to the Jews in the Holocaust? What a dumb question. I mean, I mean it's like, we're going to rank evils? I mean, that's like saying, well, was it worse that Hitler, because Hitler, Hitler killed more than just Jews. He killed a bunch of Romanies and Poles. I mean, he killed probably, you know, over 10 million people. So... You know, do we want to start getting into discussions about whether or not his killing of the Jews was worse than his killing of the Romanies, or his killing of the Romanies was worse than it? I mean, why rank evils? The one thing I can say, though, is this particular form of moral evil, and I'm using that in a moral realist, moral realist way, that it is evil, is 
particularly insidious because we don't even see it. We, don't, we, we walk down the street, we pass all the shops with the corpses, we participate in it, we have holidays and all sorts of celebrations where the center of the, of the activity, you know, where, where, where the focus of the activity is centered around some dead animal. And you know, it's, we don't even see it, and that makes it even worse. It doesn't make it morally, I'm not saying it makes it morally worse than, than anything else bad that we do, but I'm saying that it makes it dangerous to us because we've learned to become completely sort of desensitized or unaware of the violence that we participate in. That has, that threatens the corrosion of our spirit in a tremendously dangerous way. So I'm calling for a revolution, but a nonviolent one, a revolution of the heart, where if we really believe what we say we believe, if we really think animals matter morally, then I think we have an obligation to start acting on that. And you know what? People say, well, but being a vegan, it involves a lot of sacrifice. No, it doesn't. I don't look at it that way at all. As a matter of fact, I see it as a great joy. I, I think one of the, it's wonderful when you are no longer participating in the victimization of the vulnerable. That's a much better place to be than participating in the victimization of the vulnerable. Thanks. I, have, I answered some questions. <laughs>